This lecture is going to be on subspaces. So we've talked about how a system of linear equations well, can have either zero, one, or infinitely many solutions. Okay, and those are the only three possibilities. And that's great, but um, what we'd like to start talking about now is, you know, suppose our system has infinitely many solutions, what does the space of solutions actually look like, right, in our vector space? And similarly, uh, we've been talking about linear transformations, and we'd like to better understand, you know, what is a linear transformation actually doing to a vector space? And so that's where this comes in. Um, so what do we mean by a subspace? Well, first of all, it's a, uh, a subset of Rn. Okay, so a subset of Rn um, might be a subspace, it might not. A, subs a subspace will require a bit more than just being a subset. Um, it has more structure. So a subspace of Rn, uh, we're going to call it a subspace if the following conditions hold. Uh, so it's called, sorry, um, it's called a subspace if, and um, we're going to have actually three conditions. So the first condition, we want a zero vector to be in our subspace. Okay. Um, and let's give this subset a name. So I'll call it S is my subset of Rn. So we want zero to be in my subset S. Okay. Um, condition two. This is a pretty cool one. So um, let's suppose I have uh, two vectors in my set. So if u and v are in S, here's what must be true. Then so if I have two vectors in S, then I'm also asking for their sum to be in S. So I want U plus V um, to also be in S. Okay. If the sum of two vectors is not always in the set, in the subset, then I can't call it a subspace. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll do a bunch of examples of this, by the way. Um, and then my third condition is I want to be able to scalar multiply my vector by any by anything, any scalar, and then still end up in my space. So, um, so if I have a vector in my space, my subspace, uh, my subset. So if u is in um, is in S, and um, and yeah, I have a, uh, some scalar and real numbers. Then what am I going to demand? I'm going to demand that. C times U also needs to be in my uh, my subset. Okay, so subspaces are very special subsets. They're subsets that also require these three conditions. Okay, um, let's do some examples. So I'm going to do some. Uh, I'm going to ask you whether or not something is a subspace. So, um, so how about this one? Is the uh, the first quadrant I'll draw a picture of this too. Is the first quadrant of, let's take R2, a subspace. What do I mean by, what do I mean by first quadrant? So uh, here's what I mean. If we just draw a picture of R2. I mean um, this part here. Okay. So this would be the set. Um, so what is my S actually, if I had to write it out? Um, it'd be all the order pairs X comma Y, or we can think of them as vectors, right? X, Y, such that both my uh, components are, uh, well, I can say they're greater, let's say greater or equal to zero. Okay. Is this a um, subspace? What do you think? Well, let's check. So let's check number one. Is zero in S? Well, yes, because uh, luckily I made it uh, greater or equal to zero. So zero comma zero is in this set. Okay. So it's the first quadrant, but it also includes the x-axis and the y-axis. That's what I mean. 
Um, okay, so condition one is good. How about condition two? If I have two vectors in S, is their sum also going to be in S? Uh, you might be able to see that, yes, that is going to be true. Because, you know, if I have a vector pointing this way and some other vector pointing this way, well, their sum is going to look like it's going to be this vector here. Okay, you can probably convince yourself that yes, this condition 2 is also going to be true. It can also work from this definition. Well, how about condition 3? If I have a vector in my first quadrant and I have any scalar C and R, is CU also going to be an S? Is that always true? And here you have to be careful. Um, so the answer is no, because so it's no. Do you see why the answer is no? Um, the answer is no, because um, C, the scalar C can be negative. Okay, so if I take this vector here and it's multiplied by negative one, I'm, 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 I have a vector down here now. That's not in my, in my subset, right? So I started with something in my subset, I multiplied it by a scalar, and I landed outside of my subset. So this is not a subspace. Okay, we're so close too. So this is not a subspace, so, okay. Um, well, let's try to make this a subspace. So, so how about this? Draw another picture. Let's just add in everything in that other quadrant. So what if we add in our, um, what quadrant do we call that? The third quadrant, I think. So we're gonna have um, everything here. And what if we also add in everything down here? Everything in my third quadrant. Made this a little too long. Um, yeah, is that going to be a sub uh, subspace? Okay. okay, well, number one, we can still say yes. I didn't write out a definition again, but let's say we include all the axes. So we're including this, we're including this, and this, and this, okay? Um, how about condition two? Well, wait a second. We already checked condition two for this, right? Do we have to check it again? Well, yes, we do actually, um, because we, we're starting with a new subset now, right? So is this subset a subspace? Well, is it true that if I have any two vectors in this subset, their sum will also be in the subset? Is that true? So this turns out to not be true. Um, here's an example. What if I take the vector, what is this? Uh, one, two, and now I'll take this vector here. Minus two, minus one. What will I get when I add those? Well, I can do it geometrically. I get this vector here. Okay. Which is uh, minus one, one. That's not in the subset, right? So number two, condition two fails. This is actually not a subspace. Okay, so this is not looking good so far, right? It seems like nothing is a subspace. <laughs> um, well, I can tell you one subspace. So um, this is a boring example, but um, all of R2, <laughs> all of R2 is a subspace. Okay, if we add two things in R2, we're never going to go outside of R2. Um, so that's the subspace of. I need to say what it's the subspace of. It's the subspace of R2. Okay. Um, are there any other subspaces of R2, let's say? Yeah, let's, let's try to figure out all the subspaces of R2. That'd be fun. Um, so, well, we tried these two, they didn't work. So here's one subspace, all, all of R2. <laughs> There's another pretty boring subspace as well. And that's actually the, uh, the zero vector. 
So it's just a set containing the zero vector. Okay, because yes, the zero vector is in my set. <laughs> um, if I have any two vectors in my set, then their sum is in the set. So well, sum of zero plus zero is in my set because it's zero. And if I multiply by any scalar, I still end up in my set. But the zero vector times any scalar is zero. So that's another subspace. Um, I'll tell you another really cool uh, subspace. So um, any line through the origin has to go through the origin, right? Uh, we better make sure of that because we need zero to be in our uh, subspace. Uh, but yeah, any line through the origin. Okay. Well, um, why is that a subspace? I really do mean any line. Let me just draw a random line here. Has to go through the origin. Um, well, zero is in it. There it is. Um, if u and v are in my subspace, so if I take any two vectors in my subspace and I add them, I still end up in my subspace, but I do, right? Because I'm just adding two vectors along the line. So I end up somewhere else along the line. And then if I have um, a vector in my subspace and I multiply it by a scalar, was well, that going to be in my subspace? Yes, because I mean this is exactly the geometric um, picture of scaling, right? So I, I stay I stay along this line. So any line through the origin is a subspace, and it turns out these are all of them. Um, so these are the three kinds of subspaces of R two. Um, if we go to R three, we can get more interesting um, subspaces. Um, we also get planes uh, through the origin, as well as lines through the origin. Um, let, let's look at a different kind of uh, subspace, or maybe it's not a subspace. Maybe I'll ask it as a question. So, um, is the solution, I'm going to give you a system of equations, is a solution to the system, uh, okay. Here's my system of equations. X plus Y minus C equals five. That's my first one. So you might already see the answer. <laughs> um, let me write down my second equation, nevertheless. So I'll say two X plus three Y equals eight. So is the solution to this system of equations a uh, subspace? Uh, the answer is no. Do you see why? It's because uh, zero is not in my space. So what would it mean? Uh, what does it mean for zero to be in my, um, I need zero to be in my space? Well, I need the zero vector, x equals zero, y equals zero, zero equals zero to be in my space, right? But zero is not, um, is not a solution to this equation. So it's not in my, um, I should say like the solution set, right? Because there might be many solutions to the system of equations. So are all the solutions to this system of equations, do they form a subspace? No, because uh, zero is not a solution. And right, that, that corresponds to this x equals zero, y equals zero, z equals zero. You plug it into the first equation, you get zero equals five, which is nonsense. Right. Um, okay, here's one other question. So uh, let's consider the set of all um, x, y, z vectors. I'll write it uh, as columns. Um, in what space are we in? We're in R3. Well, clearly the set of all vectors in R3 is going to be a subspace, but I want a specific set. So all the vectors in R3 such that x plus y plus 2z equals 0. Okay. Is this a subspace? Okay. So for example, um, let's see. Uh, 2, 0, negative 1 will be in my set, right? Or 0, 2, negative 1. Or 0, 0, 0. Ah, zero, zero, zero is in my set. So that checks off number one, right? How about condition two? 
Well, what do we have to show? We have to show that if we have two vectors in this set, so in other words, if I have two vectors, um, so this is condition two that we're going to show. So let's say I have x, x1, well, I'll write it in columns, uh, y1, z1, that's my first vector, and then x2, y2, z2. Okay. Um, and again, this is not vector addition. These don't have the symbols over. It's just saying if you add the components, right? you get zero. So um, what about, yeah, what about uh, the sum of these two vectors? So let's suppose that, um, here's what we're going to suppose. We're going to suppose that both of these are in our set, which means this. Right? And also means this. So they both satisfy that equation. Does their sum satisfy this equation? That's what that's what I want to figure out now. Right? So in other words, is x1 plus uh, x2 plus y1 plus y2 plus uh, 2 times z1 plus z2 is that equal to zero? Question mark. Well, yes, uh, because we're assuming this. We're assuming that these two are in our set. Um, and we want to ask is, you know, is the sum of these two vectors in our set? Okay, which would be x1 plus x2, y1 plus y2, z1 plus z2. And so we want to figure out, well, does this one satisfy this relation? Is this true? Well, yes, it is, because you can just rewrite this, right? X1, you can rewrite this as x1 plus y1 plus uh, 2z1 plus x2 plus y2 plus 2z2 equals 0. But this right here is 0. And this piece right here is 0. So we get 0 equals 0. So we're done. Okay, uh, what is the third part? We need to show that if we have some vector, so let's assume that um, we have, so this is part three, we wanna assume that I have some vector x, y, z, you write x, y, z, such that, yeah, x plus y plus two z equals zero. Well, what about um, constant times this vector? Okay, so what, what if I multiply this by a constant, it's uh, C1x, C1y, C1z. Does that vector also satisfy this relationship? So is Cx plus Cy plus Cz equal to zero? Well, yes, because um, you can factor out the C. Uh, sorry, I, I should have two Cz there. Uh, so I get x plus y plus 2z two, uh, two equals 0. But what is this piece right here? That's 0 because we're starting with a vector that's in our set. Okay, and c times 0 is 0. So this is a true statement. Okay, so 3 is also good. So this is a subspace. This is a really interesting subspace. And it's a subspace defined by this plane. This is a plane in R3. It's a plane through the origin, actually. Okay, so that's an example of a subspace of R3. Um, okay, what have we noticed so far? So first of all, um, whatever the geometric object is, line, plane, whatever, um, point, all of the space, it had better go through the origin in order to be a subspace, right? This line has to go through the origin. This is a plane through the origin. Um, this, what is this describing? I mean, this is probably describing the intersection of two planes, which will be a line, but that line is not going through the origin. So that's not a subspace. Um, in fact, there's a very general statement that we can make. Um, so let me go onto a new page. So here's a, here's an important fact. This is a way that, this is how you get a lot of subspaces. Um, so the solution set, 
So here we had the, you know, the solution set to some equation. Here also we were looking at a solution set to a system of equations, but that one didn't work. Um, but uh, the solution set to any homogeneous system of equations. Any homogeneous system of equations. Is a subspace. Okay. Um, why? Why is that true? Okay, so given any number of equations, any number of variables, as long as it's homogeneous. And what does homogeneous mean again? It means right hand side is zero. And again, we can write a system of equations in this matrix form, okay? Oh, where x is the, my variables. Um, yeah, why is this true? Well, <laughs> do it like we normally do, right? So we should check, is zero in my, sub, uh, in my, um, in my subspace? That's always the first thing to ask, right? Um, yeah, well, it is, because zero is a solution. <laughs> the zero vector is a solution to any homogeneous system. We've talked about that. This, the all zero, x, x1 equals zero, x2 equals zero. Um, the zero vector is a solution to any homogeneous system, right? So that's good. Um, what do we need to show for part two? We need to show that, um, okay, so let's suppose... I have two different solutions. So let's suppose like I'll call one of them U and one of them V are solutions to this uh, system of equations, which again, I can write in matrix form. Um, well, what do I want to figure out? I want to figure out is U plus V a solution? Okay, so in other words, is A times u plus v, this is what I want to figure out, is a plus u, a times u plus v equal to zero? Well, yes, because, oh, what do we mean by u and v are solutions to ax equals zero? We mean a u equals zero and a v equals zero. Um, okay, so what is this? Well, we can use a property of matrix multiplication to rewrite this like this. I mean, in fact, what this really is, like, I'm not sure if you've uh, noticed this, but this is, this is actually just linearity. This is the property of a linear transformation, right? Because A could represent, multiplication by A is representing a linear transformation, but T of U plus V is T of U plus T of V. You can just sort of repackage them as matrices. So that's how he would prove this distributed property. Um, but uh, what's the point of doing this? Well, <laughs> AU is zero and AB is zero. So we get zero plus zero, which is zero. So we just showed that U plus V is a solution. Okay, so it's again in our subspace. So that's great. Um, and for number three, well, again, we, need to, we, we, we suppose that, for example, U is a solution. So suppose that AU equals zero. And what do we want to show? Um, we want to show that, um, so we're supposing this. And then uh, we want to look at whether any constant, right? Any scalar times my vector is again a solution. But you can just take that constant out. And then a times u is zero. So you get a constant times zero, which is zero, okay? So it's true, the uh, C, uh, A times this is zero, so any scalar multiple of a solution is again going to be a solution. And so we just proved that um, a solution set to any homogeneous system of equations is a subspace. It is not true that the solution set to an inhomogeneous system is, um, or a not homogeneous system, non-homogeneous system, is going to be a subspace. Okay, so it's only if we have zero over on this side. Okay. 
what would that look like in the system of equations? So be all all these right hand sides have to be zero. Okay. If we want it to be a subspace. Um, okay, what next? Um, great, so this is a really important fact. Um, there's one other very important fact, and this is another very uh, important way of getting at subspaces. Um, I won't prove this one, but I'll just kind of explain why it's true. So uh, the span of any set of vectors, of any set of vectors, um, in say Rn is a subspace of Rn, of course. Okay. Um, why is that true? Well, zero is in our set um, because you know, so we can have any number of vectors: v1, v2 up to say v uh, m doesn't have to be the same as that um, zero is clearly in the span of these vectors just take all the coefficients to be zero right in my linear combination um, if i take the sum of two things that are in the span of these vectors is that again going to be in the span well yes because anything in the span of these vectors can be written as a linear combination of these vectors and if I add two linear combinations of these vectors, I'm again going to get a linear combination of these vectors. Okay, so that's the explanation for part two. And for part three, it's similar. Um, and so the span of any set of vectors is a subspace. Okay. Um, let's now relate this to um, linear combination, or uh, not linear combinations, linear transformations. Okay. Um, so... These are two very important concepts that we're going to use in the following lectures. I'm not going to go into too much detail about them uh, today. This is just sort of an introduction. Uh, but I want to talk about the image and the kernel, K-E-R-N-E-L, of a linear transformation. Okay. Uh, Okay, so suppose I have, and what are these? These are two very special subspaces associated with any linear transformation, okay? Any linear transformation, we can ask, what is the image? What is the kernel? And those are not just going to be subsets of vector spaces, but they're going to be subspaces. They're going to have this extra structure. Um, so let's let um, T from Rm to Rn be a linear transformation. Okay. Then let's start with the kernel. So the kernel of T is denoted uh, ker, K-E-R, T. Put it in parentheses if you want. Um, it's basically everything that gets sent to zero <laughs> under T. Okay, so it's a set. Um, there are all the vectors in the domain. So the kernel is a subset of the domain. So there are all the vectors X in uh, Rm such that the transformation just sends that vector to the zero vector in Rn. Okay. Okay. Um, and then the image, we already talked about the image, I think, um, but I want to recall what that is. So the image of a transformation, this is also known as the, um, the range of a transformation. It's a little bit annoying in linear algebra how there are so many words that mean the same thing, but um, there's even another word for this called the column space. Um, we all mention that in a second. Um, so the, the image of T, which is denoted um, M T, not to be confused with the imaginary part of T, um, is a set. What is the image? It's just all the things we can get to 
but but notice the image is actually going to be a subset of the codomain. Okay, so the image is just all the things that look like T of something. Okay, and that's it. So um, yeah, for you know any X in RM. Okay, so again, this notation, you look at the first part, this is telling you what the set is. Okay, and this is sort of telling you, you know, it's not all the X's, it's just the X's such that they get sent to zero. And here's all the things that look like T of X, where X is any element in RM. Okay. Um, all right, uh, we can also define these for matrices. Of course, because T, any linear transformation, is associated to a matrix. So I just want to point that out. And they're given different names. So I just want to mention these names because you might see these, um, these other names. Uh, so we can also define uh, these concepts. We'll do an example of this um, so for matrices. So if A is a matrix, let's say the matrix associated to T, we can just say any matrix. Then, um, well, the, so instead of kernel, we call it the null space. The null space of A. That's kind of a, um, a good name because null meaning, uh, you know, things that are sort of zeroed out. So, so these are things that get sent to zero. Um, but in the null space of the matrix, um, it's, it's exactly the set. So null space and kernel are the same concept. I think if you even search for null space in Wikipedia, it just redirects you to kernel. Um, so the null space is, uh, let me, can I phrase it in matrix terms instead of transformation terms? Um, um, yeah, it's just all the, <laughs> It's a, the set of solutions. I mean, it's more than a set, right? It turns out to be a, uh, a subspace, but it's a set of solutions to um, a x equals. What should I put on this side? Zero, right? I'm just rephrasing this in matrix language. So a times x equals zero. In other words, yeah, it's a, a solution set to this, homo this, uh, this homogeneous uh, equation, right? We already know that's a subspace. And so because of that, we already know the kernel is a subspace. Um, okay, and, uh, okay, we already said if A is a matrix, what is the, uh, <laughs> the range of A? So instead of that, we say the column space of A. Um, this is getting kind of confusing. So let me attempt to link up these concepts. So the null space is just exactly the same as the kernel. I'm just phrasing it in terms of matrices. And then the column space is exactly the same as the image or the range. Okay. So what is this? What are all the things that we can get to in the matrix notation? That just all the, um, what is it going to be? Our matrix, uh, we can think of the columns of the matrix as vectors, and we're taking a linear combination of these columns. So it's just all the things we can get to by taking linear combinations of the columns of A. Right? In other words, it's the <laughs> span of the columns of A. Great. So that's the column space of a matrix or the image of a linear transformation. Um, these are both subspaces. And we basically uh, already went through that because, you know, again, these are direct translations of these two statements. And you want to get used to doing this, going back and forth between a statement about a, you know, whenever I give you a statement about a linear transformation, you should, you should think, ah, I can write down a statement about a matrix as well. Because a linear transformation you can represent it always as a matrix times a vector. Okay. Um, okay. Um, let's do an example.
So um, let's find a kernel and the image. So let's find the uh, find the kernel and image of this transformation T uh, given by. Maybe I won't write it as a matrix, um, but then we'll we'll get some practice uh, writing as a matrix. So T of well, I should also tell you, um, this is going to go from R3 to R2. So T of X1, X2, X3. Now, this vector will get sent, uh, will get sent to um, the vector with two components. First component is X1 minus X2. Second component is 2X1 plus 4X3. Okay, can we try to find a kernel in the image of this? Um, you might be able to just kind of figure it out by staring at this for a while, but um, let, let's try to translate this into a matrix because we already have methods to do this. Um, this is not a new this is not a new concept actually. Um, we just have to translate this into concepts we've already covered. So, um, what is my matrix A going to look like? Okay, well, I, I, again, I think what my first column is going to be the coefficients of x one. So it looks like one, two. My second column will be the coefficients of x2, minus one, zero. There's no x2 down here. And then my third column will be zero, four. Here's my matrix A. Um, okay, so what do we want? L let's do the kernel first. So for the kernel, we want to solve this. So for the kernel, we want to solve A x equals zero. We want to find all the x that satisfy that equation. But that's easy, right? We've done that. Um, that's just solving a system of linear equations. I mean, I shouldn't say it's easy. It might not be easy, but um, it's, it's something we've done many times. Um, so what, what are we trying to actually do? We're just trying to solve this augmented matrix. What do I put on this side? It's a zero vector, right? So I put zero, zero. Uh, let's go ahead and do that. So I'm just trying to find a solution to the system. That will be the kernel. Um, okay, so this row is going to stay the same. And then I'm going to do twice the first row uh, and take that away. Uh, yeah, the second row minus two times the first row. So this will be positive two, I think. And then four, zero. Okay. Um, I can go one more step. Two, four can change to a one, two. Multiply the second row by a half. Um, we have two pivots. We always have a consistent system when we're solving a homogeneous system, right? We'll always have a zero on this side. Um, and we see x3 is a free variable. So x3, I'm just going to set equal to t. And then what is this second row telling me? It's telling me that x2 plus 2x3 equals zero. So x2 is minus 2t, I guess. And what is x1? Well, the first row is telling me x1 minus x2 is 0. So x1 equals x2. All right. So x1 should also be uh, minus 2t. Great. Um, so that's my kernel um, of the linear transformation. It's just all vectors. So the kernel of t is all vectors of the form, well, it's t times 1, uh, sorry, this is x1, x2, x3. So I have minus 2, um, minus 2, 1. Okay, and I can take out that scalar t if I want. So that's my kernel, it's just all the vectors of this form. Notice that 0 is in the kernel, because I can take t to be 0. I can write this in a nice way, too. This is, isn't this just a span of my vector, minus 2, minus 2, 1? All right, so that's a nice way to write the kernel. Um, what geometric object is this? This is a line. Now you can see this is a parametric equation for a line, actually. Um, so I have some kind of line 
in three-dimensional space, and that's the kernel, that is actually all going to go to zero in my codomain. Okay, So that blue line just gets collapsed down to this point. Okay, So this concept is really giving us sort of a better way to view a geometric this geometric transformation is somehow collapsing down things this way. Okay. Or this is, yeah, let's say this is my vector. Minus two, minus two, one. Um, oh, what's the image, by the way? So we didn't do the image yet, but we can do that. Uh, actually, we can do that super quickly. Right? So what is the image of T? In this case, at least. In general, it's going to be harder. And we're going to talk about that in a future lecture. Um, but what is the image of T? Just all the things I can get to. Or in other words, it's all possible linear combinations of these columns. Right? I mean, I, I'm, I'm ignoring this. Like, I don't care about this anymore when I'm finding the image. I just want what are all the possible linear combinations of these columns? In other words, what is the span of the columns? Well, the image here is all of R2. Right? There are many ways to see that. We can just take the first two columns. And those two columns already are going to span R2. Because right? we have, we're taking two vectors that are linearly independent in R2. That means they have to span by the unifying theorem. So the image is all of R2. Um, so actually that's telling us we can just we can hit every point on this plane. Okay, so there's some collapsing down involved, going from three dimensions to two dimensions. And this, you know, this kernel here actually shows us exactly what's being collapsed down to this point, okay? Um, but we can hit every point on the plane from some point in, in this three-dimensional space. Okay, great. So there's actually one more um, really important fact about, uh, about the kernel that I'd like to talk about today. That'll be the last thing. This will also allow us to add, a, uh, add another line to the unifying theorem. So um, here's a theorem. Um, okay, so, so let's start with the linear transformation. So let T be a linear transformation then, okay, so, well, what can we say about the kernel of the, uh, of T? Well, we can't say very much. Um, other than there's always at least one vector in the kernel, namely the zero vector. That's because the zero vector always gets mapped to the zero vector. So let's say I have a transformation. Let's kind of draw it up here between these two spaces. So I have the zero vector here. And I want to know what is getting mapped to the zero vector. Well, always the zero vector will get mapped to the zero vector. And... Um, Sometimes a lot of other things will get mapped to the zero vector as well, just like in this picture. Everything here is getting mapped to the zero vector. Um, but sometimes the only thing in the kernel will be the zero vector. We want to know when that happens. Okay, and that actually turns out to be equivalent to T being one to one. Okay, that's pretty amazing. So actually, uh, th this this implication is not amazing. So so um, if t is one to one, then well of course the kernel is only going to have zero in it because that's what one to one means, right? If t is one to one, I can't have some other. Let me draw this to be a little bit, bit bigger. I can't have some other vector here mapping to zero. That's not allowed, right? Because t is one to one, right? One one to one means at most one vector in my domain is mapping to any one vector in my codomain, and that includes zero. Okay, so so this um, implication, this statement implies that statement, is, is basically just by definition of one-to-one. -one. Um, but it's this forward direction that's, that's amazing, because what it's saying is that if I know that my kernel is only zero, if I know that the only thing that maps to zero is zero, that actually forces T to be one-to-one -one everywhere else as well. That's crazy, right? Um, so 
that's saying that t cannot map, like if I know the only thing going to zero is zero, then I cannot have two points up here going to one point there. Or I cannot have infinitely many points over here going to one point there. So that can't happen. Um, so that's going to be a little bit uh, harder. Right? But, um, but yeah, this is a great way. That in practice, uh, this is a great way to show that something is one-to-one. -one. A transformation is one-to-one. -one. All you have to do is look at the kernel. If the kernel only has a zero vector in it and nothing else, your transformation has to be one-to-one. -one. So the kernel sort of controls everything. Um, okay, so let's try to show why this implies that. So we're gonna we're gonna start off by assuming that um, the kernel of a transformation of our transformation is just zero. That's what this says. Right? It's just a zero vector. Okay. Let's, we want to show this, that, that t is one to one. And how do we show that? Well, we have to show that uh, there's not any one vector that multiple vectors map to. Right. So, so you know, if, if t were not one to one, you know, let's do it this way. So if t were not one to one, right, one to one like that, um, then what does that mean? There would be two. You know, at least two, but certainly we can find two different vectors, uh, u and v, okay, such that uh, t of u equals t of v. They both map to the same thing. Okay, so t of u and t of v are the same. Okay, we want to actually show that this is not possible. We're assuming that t is not one to one. We're going to show that's nonsense. That t actually does have to be one to one. You cannot have this case. Uh, how are we going to show that? Well, let's look at this. This is a really cool um, argument here. I'm going to move both of these onto the same side. What do I get on this side? Well, the zero vector. Now we can use the property of a linear transformation to rewrite this as t of u minus v equals zero, okay? Because t is linear. So again, only works for linear transformations. If it's not a linear transformation, this is definitely not true. This kind of equivalence. Um, okay. Well, what do we have now? We have t of some vector equals zero. Okay, that means that uh, this is in the kernel. That's in the kernel, right? Um, but wait a second, the only thing in the kernel is zero, right? So say, but uh, the kernel is only the zero vector. So this has to be the zero vector, u minus v. Which means u has to equal v, okay? So we showed that, you, yeah, <laughs> if t were not one-to-one, -one, there would be two different vectors u and v that satisfy this. But if they satisfy this, they actually have to be the same vector because the kernel is, is just zero. Okay. So that therefore T, therefore T actually does have to be one to one. Because if it's not one to one, we just got a contradiction. We assumed U and V were different, but then we just showed that they're the same. So therefore T has to be one to one. Okay. And so, um, in particular, what about if T is a transformation from Rn to Rn, right? Rn to Rn. That's the setup for the unifying theorem. Okay. But this is useful in general. Again, like I said, if you want to check that something is one to one, a transformation is one to one, all you have to do is look at the kernel. Okay, if I know that, for example, the vector 2, 2, 1 is in the kernel of my transformation, it cannot be 1 to 1. 
right? Um, but if I know the vector zero is the only thing in the kernel, that actually forces t to be one to one everywhere. Um, so, okay, if t is a transformation from Rn to Rn, we can use this. All these things are either all true at the same time or all false at the same time. Don't get confused by uh, this following our equivalent, right? I'm not saying that any transformation R, Rn to Rn is, is always going to be onto or one to one. But I'm saying if it is onto, then it's one to one and all of these other things. Okay, so let's add a seventh uh, line to this. Okay, we just showed that the kernel being just a zero vector is equivalent to t being one to one. We've got t, equal, t is one to one here. That is equivalent to the kernel of t being zero. Okay. Great. Um, can we also write something about the image just since we talked about that? What is the image of t? We'll look at number four. If t is onto, what does that mean? It means the image of t is everything. Yeah, so image of t is all of Rn. Okay, so these are all equivalent. So notice seven and eight. These are equivalent. Notice we, we kind of linked this one up to that and we linked that one up to that. And then these two are equivalent for, for other reasons. Um, but all eight of these statements are now equivalent. So for example, if the kernel of a linear transformation is just zero, if the only thing being mapped to zero is zero, then the image has to be all of Rn. These are very strong and powerful statements you can say about a linear transformation. Um, if you have very little information about this transformation, you can just say so many things. That's what this, this theorem is all about. Um, okay, so we'll wrap up this video. Thanks for watching.